1994, a team of experts traveled to Egypt to tackle the problem. But their attempt to erect an obelisk, just a fraction of the size of the ancient ones, fell short. Carved from a single piece of granite, an obelisk could rise over 100 feet and weigh up to 500 tons. How did they do it? As time went on, the quest to please and impress Amun drove pharaohs to erect bigger and bigger obelisks. Weighing up to 500 tons, these were some of the largest single stones ever quarried anywhere in the world. They were carved by hand and adorned with intricate hieroglyphs. Somehow, the Egyptians managed to stand them on end without breaking them. each balanced upon a small stone pedestal with no support other than its own enormous weight. Only a handful of ancient obelisks survive intact in their original positions. All physical evidence of how they were raised has disappeared except for one tantalizing clue. This groove is one of the only direct pieces of evidence we have as to how they actually erected the obelisk. On every pedestal stone, a deep groove is carved in one side. Without this groove, the obelisk might slip across its base. But the groove acts as a break, and it helps keep the obelisk aligned when it's pulled to vertical. The trick is getting one edge of a stone weighing hundreds of tons safely into the turning groove. It literally just moves from there onto the roller point here. Mark Whitby is one of Britain's leading engineers. And so we start applying load at the front. He's devised a unique theory of how the ancient Egyptians might have raised their obelisks. Tips it over. Inspired by the complex wood and rope work on Egyptian ships, Mark has designed an elaborate system to rotate the obelisk slowly down onto its pedestal stone. Just pull it to vertical and put it in the position much as it really is in real life. He hopes to try out his idea in a quarry in Aswan. A 30-ton granite obelisk has been placed atop an earthen ramp and preparations are underway to lower it 12 feet into a turning groove. The first task is to assemble a large wooden framework that will provide the mechanical advantage to rotate the obelisk safely. In this supporting role is Rick Brown, a sculptor and timber framer from Massachusetts. At the moment, he has no idea that events will soon propel him to center stage in the obelisk drama. Meanwhile, Owen Roberts and his son, Yola, are in charge of rigging nearly a mile's worth of rope. With all this rope and wood, Mark Whitby hopes to harness the giant stone and carefully control its descent. While the engineer and his small army of assistants scramble to build their complicated contraption, Roger Hopkins is pursuing a completely different approach. With the large-scale obelisk already spoken for, Roger is left to experiment with a mini two-ton block. And he's not happy about it. If they ever give me a decent obelisk to work with, then we can do something. But no, I always end up in dog patch with the puniest little 
you know what I mean. Even though his obelisk is small, Roger still has to lower it with care. Up on the ramp. But instead of relying on ropes, he prefers a method that is more low-tech. This is more like a, an ancient elevator of sorts. So you're going to put it out onto this sand and then take the sand away to lower it down to its base. Yeah, we're going to drag it out, drop it on this pile of sand. Now I've got... Buried under 21 tons of sand is Roger's miniature pedestal stone, complete with turning groove. This block of wood goes all the way down to the turning groove of my pedestal stone. Likewise, so do the, I have a timber here and another one on the other side, which will help guide me when I'm taking, removing the sand out from underneath the obelisk. Roger's homespun technique doesn't impress Mark Whitby. What we've got to do when you're moving these heavy stones around and wanting to put them somewhere is you've got to have absolute control over them. Imagine this for real with a 300 ton obelisk. And look at the sort of control Roger's got right now with his sledge. I want, you know, we've got to come. It's starting to shift over that way. Stand up. There's a thing called planning. You have to plan every single step in advance. And it's not appropriate necessarily to run back and get the chainsaw and slice off bits of sledge because you haven't thought about how long it needed to be to begin with. That's it. A loss. In spite of Mark's criticisms, Roger is not alone in his support for the sandpit method. We have a number of pieces of evidence that sand was used in this way for lowering colossal sarcophagi down tomb shafts and for raising monuments like obelisks. There's actually an ancient papyrus where one scribe taunts another one, challenging him to design a way to erect a monument of thy lord, namely the pharaoh could be an obelisk, maybe a statue. The 3,000 year old document reads, empty the space that has been filled with sand beneath the monument of thy Lord, so that the monument may be established in its place. There it goes, there it goes. Many scholars believe well, the Egyptians used sand, but others argue that it's difficult to control. To come forward and over this way a little Removing bit. it from around the base of a three or 400 ton obelisk could be dangerous. Okay. You know, we've come quite a way so far. Okay, we got it pretty level for you all the way around. Yeah. A little bit here and a little bit there. After a couple of hours, the obelisk is reaching the bottom of the sand pit. There, just move. And Roger just move. is now removing the sand with his bare hands. Roger, yeah, yeah. do you think they would ever have been literally doing it by hand with a 400 tonner like you are? Yep. I'm asking, you think so? Yeah. Why not? Now you're in charge and you're doing this, so you can watch out. Why? Watch out what? Well, it just move moved, it. you know, ever so slowly. Well, it looks freaky from here. Yeah. With your hand under there. I could see it moving. I could even feel it moving. Now, do you think in ancient Egypt, the guy in charge would literally be sticking his hand under there? If he failed, his head would be rolling. He'd stick his hand under there. He'd stick his hand under there. He'd, he'd want to make sure this thing was going to go exactly the way he wanted. It's literally moving by millimeters. Millimeter by millimeter, the obelisk sinks lower. There's the turning groove, right there. And I've got my obelisk posed right over it. Look at that. Look at that, will you? Clean it out for the rest of the way. There it goes. Wow. That was its final adjustment. Yeah, I'm glad my fingers weren't under there. Roger's obelisk came to rest at an angle of about 60 degrees. <laughs> Weighing only two tons, it's not difficult to pull the stone to vertical. But 
the ancient obelisks were up to 500 tons, and pulling them upright was not so simple. To make the job easier, Mark Whitby thinks the Egyptians would have lowered their obelisks to a much steeper angle, like 80 degrees. Our goal with this method is to get the obelisk into as steep an angle as possible. Um, actually, to get it to vertical with, ver with not a lot of effort. Um, we're trying to control it very precisely in the way it comes forward. To make the obelisk go forward, gangs of men will pull on ropes suspended from the wooden frame. Mark hopes that as these ropes tighten, the obelisk will tilt downwards and eventually rotate around the large pivot log. This mechanism is a bit of an ingenious device, but actually I'm an engineer and that's exactly what engineer means, an ingenious person. You know, as an engineer, it means we've actually planned the process. We've done lots of calculations. We've calculated dimensions, we've calculated weights, we're calculating how the weights move as the, as the obelisk rotates. I'm, I'm happy our sums are right, but equally, you know, one has to double, double check and we're going to find out shortly. Mark has done a lot of calculations, and of course we know that the Egyptians had mathematics, they had fractions, they calculated slopes by rise and run, but they probably didn't use the calculations that Mark has used in order to design the system of raising an obelisk. The Egyptians would have approached it more by experience. And so the first thing to do is to actually apply some tension to the, to the ropes pulling down here, and to rotate it about... Mark's method has a number of things going for it. It assumes that the obelisk was tipped, which is very likely. And then it also uses uh, outriggers of a sort, like they used in their nautical technology, their boats and their ships. It places great reliance on the use of ropes to pull the obelisk down in a very controlled way. And we know that they would have done this in a very controlled way. Sixty men are brought in to pull on the ropes attached to the giant wooden frame. Nobody in front of here. Okay. The time has come Nobody to test Mark Whitby's method okay. and see how well he can control the obelisk. Uh, no, behind here. Behind here. Everyone is warned to stand back, just in case the 30-ton obelisk tilts too far and topples off the platform. With each tug, the giant stone teeters precariously. Rick Brown places wooden chocks beneath the rising obelisk. I think maybe it'll be two to three pulls before, I believe, before it actually comes down onto this bearing. So I think we're doing quite well in that sense. It's not a bad system. Mark's first goal is to tilt the obelisk down so that the pivot log makes secure contact with the top of the platform. This log is then supposed to rotate right up to the edge, guiding the obelisk precisely toward its pedestal, 12 feet below. But the jerky rocking of the obelisk creates a problem that Mark did not anticipate. Oh, get the bear again. The giant log has slipped out of its intended position and is moving dangerously close to the edge. We've come down on the, on the bearing, slightly in front of where we expected, because the, the um, bearing slipped forward. Now we're about two eight. As it rotates forward, it gets very, very close to that edge. Now, that's not necessarily a problem, um, as long as it doesn't come over the edge. The rigging team struggles to pound the log back into place. Fearing that the human pullers may jerk the obelisk off the ledge, Mark decides to supplement the pull with a counterweight, a three and a half ton block of stone. Down, pull, come on. Uh, no, lot of stretch in it. When its timber supports are removed, Mark hopes the weight of the stone will apply a steady downward pressure on the ropes, doing the work of a hundred men. 
But as the stone is lowered to the ground, Mark finds that the ropes holding the counterweight have simply stretched. Quite a lot of stretching. And the obelisk hasn't moved an inch. It's more stretched down here, Rick, than anything else. In spite of all his plans and calculations, Mark's method is not working. Very disappointed, we're going to have to rebuild the whole lot. Desperate to make some progress, Mark decides to take a modern shortcut, suspending the counterweight in midair with a crane. But this risky move just causes more problems. Mark's quickly changing plans are taking their toll on the rigging crew. Are you with me, Gulla? Oh, I'm what slipping out of your grasp a bit, mate. Well, what I'm saying is that the knot, we've got to make a knot that works, or we've got to find another way of doing it. Well, the system I gave you before seemed to be working okay. Now no. you've changed it to what you wanted no, no, now. No. What I'm saying is that that distance is now, you know, it's bigger. With morale plummeting, Mark Whitby must give up on the counterweight. Well, it's a very frustrating day, and most of the day was taken up with the counterweight, which in fact was just a substitute for a workforce that we didn't feel we could handle. The machines haven't worked, so now we're just going to try the people that we had intended to try in the first place. Over 200 men are put on the ropes. Everyone senses this is Mark's last chance to make his method work. Loosen those ropes! Loosen those ropes, Rick! Loosen the ropes! Keep those ropes loose! Mark's old problem with the pivot log has returned to haunt him. Once again, the giant log has crept forward. And this time, it has gone too far. What's happened is actually the, the, the log, as, it, as they pull, has, has walked forward. The design is on the basis that as it rotates, it actually comes to an edge. We're now so near the edge that as it rotates, it may come off the edge. And that's not nice. The pivot log has slid right up to the edge of the ramp. And now the chances of the obelisk crashing down have become too great. Defeated, Mark is forced to admit the situation is too dangerous and decides to abandon the attempt. Well, right now I feel gutted personally and from, for the whole team. We've got to this point where we realize that to go forward would not be a good idea and is possibly negligent in the sense that we're putting at risk people's lives. I think we all made a critical mistake, not just Mark. We wondered what was the most complicated technology they had, and we said it was in boats. And then we said, well, how would they have applied that to a job like raising the obelisk? But in translating boat technology to the particular situation of the obelisk, we developed this monster, and I think that was the wrong way to go about it. Hold! 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 Another obelisk raising attempt has ended in failure. Most of the team is completely demoralized. Timber framer Rick Brown is the exception. We know it can be done. It's just how far, how far we want to go with, with attempts, and I, I think we can make it happen. I really think if we stayed here a week, we could, we could raise this obelisk. But unfortunately, Nova's time in Egypt has come to an end. Back at home, jobs and families beckon. The search for answers will have to continue somewhere else. Six thousand miles from Aswan, at a granite quarry in Massachusetts, a new plan is being hatched that may solve the obelisk puzzle once and for all. See if it'll uh, do it without it. No. Rick Brown is the one member of the team who couldn't give up. I'm a sculptor, and I live in the world of making things. I have a passion for making things. And the idea of walking away was just, uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't imagine not solving this problem. In Egypt, Rick was enthusiastic about Mark Whitby's plan. 
But now he decides to take another look at the sand pit. Okay, check your alignment. Oh, well, take those one back there. Rick liked the simplicity of Roger's method, but one thing worried him. There it goes. Roger there used goes. sand that was slightly damp. It didn't flow well and had to be dug out from directly under the obelisk. Potentially very he dangerous. Make sure this thing was going to go exactly the way he wanted. Rick decides to use dry sand, abundant in Egypt's arid climate. With the help of his wife and fellow sculptor Laura, Rick begins planning a new kind of sandbox. Okay. Wow! Look at it go. Okay. The, the, this is great sand you got. This is dry sand. That's important. The uh, sand pit is uh, set up so nobody ever has to go inside. It's perfectly safe. Is that the main advantage between uh, this method and doing it the way Roger did it, where he was inside the box digging? Well, that way nobody's going to get hurt. Well, I didn't get hurt. So it all depends on the flow. You use the flow instead of diggers. With dry sand, the sand will flow. And With wet sand, we go home. The main force at work in the sand pit is gravity. The obelisk sinks under its own weight. But how is it steered into the turning groove? Rick will try to control the stone with several brake ropes. In addition, the back wall of the box is a series of steps, carefully aligned with the turning groove. After perfecting his method with scale models, Rick is about to get his turn with a 36-foot obelisk. Well, Roger, we have a ramp. We have a 25-ton obelisk sitting on top. Maybe 30 tons? Maybe 30 tons. I doubt it. We have a sandbox. The sandbox is filled to the top of sand. If you come up here, you can see this opening. That's our portal. The sand will flow right out of the portal. Right now, it's choked off. What we're going to do is we're going to take that out by hand with hose and pull all the sand out, and as we do that, the obelisk will rotate around and fall right into the center of the turning groove. All the details of Rick's model have been scaled up for the 25-ton stone, including three gigantic ropes that run the length of the obelisk and are secured to two large brake logs. One inch, okay, so we pick it up here. Assisting Rick are friends from the Timber Framers Guild a group dedicated to traditional building techniques. With everything in place, the team is ready to begin. OK, let's point this thing to the sky. First, the movement of the obelisk is almost imperceptible. There we go. But slowly, the point of the stone begins to rise. Day feels very Egyptian to me. The ramp, the box looks very archaic. The colossal ropes, the big logs, the sand. It's big and it's massive, but it's using very simple forces, simply the force of flowing sand. Yeah, well. They had no problems throwing thousands of people at the job. This is the approach the Egyptians would have taken. The approach takes time. After half a day of digging, the obelisk has only rotated a third of the way toward the turning groove. As the hours pass and the obelisk sinks deeper into the pit, 
Rick's method is truly put to the test when more and more pressure falls on the brake ropes. How much of the rope stretched so far? Well, the ropes have stretched around seven to eight inches. Wow, really? Yeah, and we, uh, we, we're still well within the safety range. Hold. Rick's team predicted a certain amount of stretch in the ropes. But if their estimates are wrong, the obelisk could overshoot the turning groove. Tension mounts as the stone approaches the critical angle of 75 degrees. With the obelisk nearing the back of the sandpit, Rick can't resist the temptation to jump in and dig for himself. Gauge pull. Gauge pull. Gauge pull. The obelisk is now leaning against the wall of the sandpit and is directly in line with the turning groove. That's the turning groove. That's the turning groove. Right here. See, see the curvature? Yeah, there it is. You can see if I hold this tape as a straight edge, you can see where the obelisk is going to come right down inside the turning groove. Wow, that's a bullseye. Direct hit. We're just about nine and a half inches from the top of the pedestal stone. That looks pretty good. Now it's a matter of gradually releasing the brake ropes. and removing the last bits of sand. For three more hours, the work goes on. Finally, in the dark of night and without a sound, the 25-ton obelisk nestles into its groove. When the sun returns and the sandbox is removed, Rick can appreciate how far he's come. You can see we have the obelisk in the turning groove. It's at 75 degrees. Most of the hard work's done. But we, remaining is a task that is, uh, could be daunting, and that is we have to uh, now pull the obelisk that last 15 degrees into the 90 degree position. Those of you who have been trained in pulling, please come this way and report right here. Well, the worst thing that could happen is, is that we lose control in the pull and the obelisk uh, comes com crashing down. This is a very tense moment. If you would go ahead and take the ropes and pull the slack out of them. Leading the pullers is Rick's colleague, engineer Greg Mullen. Greg's job is to scare the undisciplined volunteers into pulling slowly and gently. You can't be talking. You all notice I'm married. You notice what's missing on my hands? Go ahead and take your rings off. If one of the ropes flies, it can catch your ring and it'll pull the meat off your finger. All right, go ahead and take up the slack. Take it slow, get it light. Keep pulling. Keep pulling. If they pull too hard, the fragile obelisk could topple over and crash to the ground. Gently, gently. To prevent That's this kind of disaster, Rick's team is once again using brake ropes. While the gang below pulls the obelisk toward vertical, the brake crew holds it back, letting the ropes out slowly so the obelisk can't work up any momentum. The brake lines have got it. We are at 89. What do we got? 89, 89 degrees. OK. We have touchdown. We have a freestanding obelisk. Your inspiration, Roger. This is the way the Egyptians did it. This is the way we did it. We were mimicking the Egyptians. It's a very perfect moment. 
Egyptians had to do it with as much control and just as slowly because they not only had months and months of hieroglyphs that had been cut, people may have died, a lot was invested, and they would have had just as much control. I'm glad we got it done. Common sense, and what I knew intuitively would work, proved itself. I'm a happy camper. This is the kind of thing that uh, we uh, had hoped for, and, and, it, and it happened because from the very beginning, we believed that uh, if we acted and thought like the Egyptians, that we would have the success. You know, the Egyptians were, were learning through keen observation, looking carefully at all the details. They learned how these materials behaved, and, and once they understood that, they used those forces of nature to be able to do something as magnificent as this. When the great obelisks of Egypt were pointed to the sky, the engineers in charge of the raising would have done all they could to protect the pharaoh's monument. Most likely, the process was slow and painstaking, relying on human sweat and the gentle force of sand. The method may have been simple, but the result was spectacular.